Hi everybody and welcome to the table. Today's verse is taken from the book of Revelations, chapter 21, verse 1. And it says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Amen. Let's worship, church. I 
moment asking for your grace for your mercy for your refreshment we ask that you come and bless us with the Holy Spirit and surround us we ask that you cleanse our minds and our hearts and renew our spirits with courage with strength with steadfastness we ask for the courage to surrender ourselves to you, to leave our life in your hands, to leave our health and our finances and our families in your hands. We know that you are constantly providing for us, that you are constantly caring for us, protecting us, shielding us and preparing us. We love you. We thank you, and we ask all these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen, church. Have any of you been watching the series on PBS called Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates Jr.? I, I, I love this show. Uh, they're in season seven, and I just started watching it, so I wish someone had told me about it earlier. But I'm really enjoying this show called Finding Your Roots, and a very interesting show where there's these twists and turns, and the guests that Henry Louis Gates Jr. has on there, they end up finding out more about their roots and their ancestry, and there's always some wonderful surprise. So I'm really enjoying that show. Well, that show, I believe, in terms of its title, Finding Your Roots Chronicles, is also helping us find and remember our roots. You'll remember last week, as we said in the book of First Chronicles, it starts out with the word Adam. It's full of genealogies, the first nine chapters, all pointing towards you know this royal genealogy, this royal line that's pointing forwards towards a coming Messiah and coming anointed king. And then in uh, the, the New Testament, Matthew chapter 1, there's this beautiful genealogy that overlaps with that, that genealogy there in the book of First Chronicles. Uh, yeah, Matthew the gospel writer uh, starts with uh, Abraham in that genealogy. And then in the book of Luke, a writer there, Luke chapter 1, that genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. Uh, similar, very similar to the way that uh, First Chronicles uh, does it. So the point being here, uh, at welcome back to Journey Through Scripture, and we're in Second Chronicles today, uh, following up from uh, last week's book that we were in, First Chronicles. And so uh, it's just beautiful as you're reading through the Bible and as I'm reading through the Bible and we're journeying our way through this one book uh, each week, we're beginning to see that the Old Testament has great uh, unity with the New Testament. The Old Testament is predicting, the Old Testament is uh, building a scaffolding around something spectacular that is uh, being erected, and that is 
this need for a king, this need for a Messiah. And in the New Testament, as we're going to be getting into, um, I, I guess maybe at the end of this year, <laughs> beginning of next year, we're going to begin to see how Jesus powerfully fulfills that. So there's this unified story. Well, each week we give a narrative summary and then a sample passage. I invite you to go back to last week's narrative summary. It'll be much uh, fuller than today's narrative summary on uh, Second Chronicles. But a little review from last week. You remember that Samuel and Kings reads similar to the book of Chronicles. Now, Second. Uh, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, the audience there, you'll remember we said this last week, but the, the audience is the, the Israelites who are in exile. They are, um, uh, the, the, the author there of Samuel and Kings is showing those people why they are uh, about to go into exile, why it happened. Remember, it was repetitive injustice and idolatry and, and no repentance whatsoever. And then Chronicles, the audience, is this group of Israelites who have now returned from exile. They've been in exile for 70 years, and now they're returning. And so uh, we said last week that Samuel and Kings reads like headlines, and the book of Chronicles reads more like a documentary, or is like you should watch it like a documentary. There's been some 300, maybe 300 years of history that's gone by. Uh, after the writings of Samuel and Kings. And so you may ask, well, which one's more accurate? Well, both. Both are very accurate, looking back on the same history, yet told in a different way. Samuel and Kings, remember, it's asking, who is our promised king? Who is this promised king going to be? And so one king after another that's, that we're introduced to in the book of Samuel and Kings, we realize, nope, that's not the perfect uh, God-loving and people-loving and justice-loving king that God had promised. And that's the whole point. That's the whole point of Chronicles is that it's saying, no, no, no. None of those, none of those were to fulfill the kingship uh, that belongs to someone else. And so the Chronicles are, are written around 400 years B.C., and that is the point. They're going to have to wait another approximately 400 years before uh, Christ Jesus is introduced to them as their king. So the last words of book of Chronicles is, may the Lord their God be with them. And the Hebrew Bible ended in that way. In the Hebrew Bible, not your English copy of your uh, Bible translation, but in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament ends with the book of Chronicles, and it's quite beautiful the way that that ends right there, because then the next book would be the book of Matthew, and there would be a beautiful genealogy right there in Matthew chapter 1, uh, overlapping with the genealogy there in Chronicles, again, really showing us that indeed the Lord their God would be with them through this person and king of the nations called Jesus Christ. There's our narrative summary. We invite you to go back and listen to the narrative summary on 1 Chronicles. And if you haven't been listening to these uh, sermons or episodes as we've been going through the books of the Bible, we invite you to go back, uh, all the way back to Genesis and join us in this journey through Scripture. Well, a sampler passage that speaks to us very, very beautifully today is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 11 through 22. And of course, there's our QR code. If, uh, I invite you to follow along with us and engage. Engage in on this uh, study and uh, time to turn our minds and our hearts and our emotions on as we are fully engaging here. Christianity Today, a well-known publication, back in 2016, and this was when Donald Trump was elected, wrote an article, and in Christianity Today, there in 2016, that article, they were asking this question, which Bible verse was searched for more than any other in that year? Which Bible verse 
was sort of the most popular and searched for more than any other Bible verse. Do you have a guess? Can you guess which Bible verse that would have been? Remember 2016? Remember that uh, presidential election here in the United States? Think about uh, that for just a moment, and I'll give you a couple of hints. This verse was often quoted by famous, famous Christians, famous Christian leaders at that time. And this uh, verse was often quoted at the National Day of Prayer. Uh, any guesses? Let me start reading this verse for you, and then I'm sure it'll sound very familiar to you. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Perhaps you've seen that on a tattoo somewhere. And uh, yeah, the graphic artist, the tattoo artist, probably most likely has the American flag there. And then the text overlay is this Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And what I'm hoping to, to, to get across today is that Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 isn't talking about presidential elections, and it isn't talking about America. It's not even talking about the United States of America. Shock, I know. And so as we read the passage in context, I believe the chronicler is going to help us see the entire passage as the text that should be laid not over the American flag, but over the entire globe, the all nations approach here, speaking of God's coming king as king of the nations. And so my intent, I believe the chronicler's intent is yes to engage and that we should pray, verse 14, but not to the exclusion of the other verses that are in this context and not highlighting America above the other nations of the world. Assuming that God to heal our land, the word our, there means our here in America. Well, since context is king, let's read the passage in context, shall we? Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 11 through 22. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. As for you, if you walk before me as David, your father, walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you, and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne, as I covenanted with David, your father, saying, You shall not lack a man to rule Israel, but if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I, that I have given you. And this house that I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. And I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. At this house which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, Why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? Then they will say, Because they abandoned the Lord the God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt and laid hold 
on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this disaster on them. Reading it in context is very, very key. What would you say to a group of exiles coming back home? What would you need to hear? If you had been a slave and now you're returning from that exile, you're now returning home, what would you need to hear? That's what the chronicler, that's what the chronicler is doing. He's crappy. Chroniclers crafting a message that God has given them, and they are delivering a message on point. They're thinking about, they, they understand the story. They, they, they know the books of Ezra and Nehemiah that, that, that indeed that Jerusalem would fall into captivity. They, they would go off into exile, and now they know, too, that they would also now return. And so that's what the chronicler is doing. He's writing to that group. What would you say to a group like that? I think what you would want to say to that group, if you were the writer, or I think what you would want said to you, is we would need to be reminded who we are and who God is. And we we need to know where God's story is going, after all. Well, let's start here with that first one who we are and who God is. Who we are and who God is. Context is king. Verse 14, it says, my people called by my name. Now God is, you heard us read the passage there. Solomon, (laughs) Solomon was listed, I think at least three times there in the passage. So this is around the dedication of the temple And so God is speaking these words when he says, my people called by my name. And again, you may think of that tattoo there of the American flag. God is speaking these words specifically to the people of Israel who are coming home from exile. That's the context. They have been dominated and enslaved by a foreign power. And so there's a reminder of a promise that God had made to Abraham. You'll remember this promise earlier in Journey Through Scripture. God says, I will be their God. And they will be my people. There's this deep sense of finding your roots where they knew that they belonged to God. That was their deepest identity. Verse 14, he says, I will heal their land. God is referring in this verse to a very, very specific land. Not the good old USA, not whatever country that you reside in per se. In this context, God is referring to the land of Israel, a land that is really theirs, a land that God had promised to give to them as a covenant blessing. That that, that was ancient Canaan. That was was the promise, the real estate there located between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. Now, why why a need to heal this land? He's saying, I will heal their land. Well, Well, why is there a need to heal the land? Well, God had warned his people centuries before that whenever he made a covenant with them, that if they broke the covenant, God would send drought insects, and plagues. That's recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 28. How would God heal the land? What's his plan? What is God up to? Well, it would be by sending rain to end the drought and by removing the locust and by stopping the plague. God cares for. We, we just celebrated Earth Day that, you know, this week, and it's not just because it's, a, it's some political thing here in our country, you know, that we do so. It, it, God cares for his creation and his land. Now see, these former slaves, this original audience and exiles are returning home and, and they're eager to get back home. They're eager to get back to work again, get back in, you know, some regularity, some rhythms that they were used to. 
but they needed to be reminded of their roots. So important for them to be reminded of who they are and who God is. And so the chronicler, that's why the chronicler is doing this. There's a retelling of the history of Israel, similar to what Moses does in the Pentateuch. There's a retelling of the story of the Exodus. I mean, when you're reading through the Pentateuch, you'll remember there's sort of this repetitiveness of the Exodus story that just keeps coming up. And the reason why is those people are prone to forget. We are those people. We need to be reminded of our roots. And if we're not reminded of who we are and whose we are and who this God is, we're going to find our roots in our ethnicity. We're going to find our roots in what country we came from. We're going to find our roots in maybe where we graduated from. All of those are superficial ways compared to our deepest identity. So this question for you and for me today is, who are you? No, no, not what do you do, but who are you? And the encouragement is to find your roots in this story. Finding your identity in this God, the God of the scriptures. Now this modern day, my people, would be the Christian church. Not any one particular nation, but the Christian church, God's church, the bride of Christ that's global. In the modern day, heal their land. The Christian church does not have a land. Yes, certainly. Certain churches maybe have a building or have some sort of property, but the Christian church at large globally, there's no land. And that's because the Christian church is a pilgrim people. The writer Peter, there in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, it says the church is a group of exiles. We're aliens, we're strangers, we're exiles in this world. So that's because God isn't just committed to one nation, but, but he's committed to his people around the globe, around the world. Now the message here that the chronicler is getting across to us is this God is the only God who hears, who forgives, and who heals. Remember verse 14, my people call by my, by my name. You know, if they, if, they, if they humble themselves, if they seek God and they pray and, and, they, and they turn from their wicked ways, that, that, that God is going to hear them. He's going to forgive them and he's going to heal. These are God's actions. God truly does hear. He says that repetitively in the Pentateuch. I have heard your cries. Your very prayers, your, your cries have reached my ears. I hear you. I care about you. That God forgives. That only this God, the God of the scriptures, only this God promises forgiveness that's truly free to the recipient. Costly. Very, very costly to the giver. That is God. Through the sacrifice of God's only son, Christ. But, but free to us, the recipient. And God's healing, that God heals our land, that is, he cares for this physical creation that he made, and that God cares for healing people who suffer because of sin in our world, and because of injustice, and because of the uh, systemic injustice, and, and because of in disease in our world. God heals The chronicler is wanting them and wanting us to reflect on this part, and that is who we are and who God is. The second thing here is, where is God's story going? Yeah, where God's story is going. Where, where's, it, where's it going? Now, any journey that's truly going somewhere needs to identify the current location. Right? You, know, you know, as you look at a map, there's that little icon that says, you are here. Well, you need to identify where you are uh, as you're going on any journey. And where was the original audience in God's story? 
the original audience listening to the Chronicler, remember their exiles now coming back home, where were they in this grand story of God? Well, they would have known about creation, would have known about Genesis as they had been familiar of that God who created all things. They would have also been familiar with the fall, the fall of humanity. And Adam was a representative for all of humanity. And so when Adam fell into sin, Adam represented all of us, and so that we're all sinners affected by sin. And yet they would have been looking forward, that original audience would have been looking forward to the part of the story called redemption. That Christ would be coming into the world, this redeemer, king, this priest, would be coming into the world. Look at verse 18 in our passage. See, I told you we weren't just going to focus on verse 14. Verse 18 says, this is God promising, I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father, saying, you shall not lack a man to rule Israel. Now this is you know, some, a man to rule Israel. These are not words uh, of some sort of male-dominant society that God is either de desiring or prescribing or predicting, but rather it's referring to the God-man, Jesus Christ, who would come and be our forever king of all the nations. I I'd love to see that tattoo of that verse, instead of verse 14 over the American flag, I'd love to see verse 18 as the text overlay over a globe of the entire world, highlighting God's promise. Well, where are we right now in the story? That, that, that's where the original audience was. Where are we in the story? Well, we remember the, the, the part of the story, creation, fall, and redemption, that Christ came and now we're in between redemption, a story called redemption, that part of the story where Christ came, and restoration, that part of the story where Christ is coming again. We're in between those two. We're in between those two parts in our story. Now our future is restoration, where Christ returns and heals the land, God's creation God's people, God, God brings healing perfectly, totally restores all things. And yet right now, the land is truly suffering. The land, not just America, but, but, but the land. God's creation, God's people, it, it, they're suffering with violence, with police violence, with a global pandemic with system, systemic injustice, the creation itself is longing and crying out to be restored. All of this will not be fixed right now. We grieve that. We lament that. There's no set of rules that we can follow. There's no uh, humbling ourselves enough and seeking God enough and doing all of these things so that God will, you know, Heal everything right now. Perfect healing of the land isn't going to happen right now. It's, that, that's what's to come. That's what happens when Christ finally returns and brings the restoration that we all long for. And meanwhile, we're, we're to be loving our neighbors as we're in between these two chapters of the story. We're, we're to be loving our neighbors we're to be activists. Yeah, we're going to see some change, and we should expect to see some change, but we should also wait in hope and eagerly look forward to an epic ending of God's story where God truly restores all things. If you were to write yourself a letter, you know, just think about yourself in the future looking back on your present day self, what would you say to yourself? What sort of letter would you write to yourself? I think if we had the ability to do that, you know, because of our deep roots in God, like finding your identity in God, 
and knowing the stability and the joy and, and, and the absolute love that we know and that we feel from God, because of that identity, because of those deep roots, I think we would tell ourselves there needs to be humility, there needs to be prayer, we need to seek God, and we need to turn from our wicked ways. Well, that's exactly what verse 14 is doing. Let's look at each of those as they apply to us today. Humility. Humility. This, this principle here, overwhelming principle here, is that God is going to humble a nation when it needs to be humbled. Any nation. God is going to do that humbling. And that's because God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter chapter 5. And, and that's why it says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, so that at the proper time he may lift you up. It's the Holy Spirit, God's very presence, that does the convicting of sin. This is not your role to convict someone else or my role. We're, we're not even qualified. This is the, the role of the Holy Spirit that brings about humility in a person. And then the boldness also that the Holy Spirit brings about in a person to be an evangelist, to tell others about this good news. God converts us, brings this boldness and humility into our lives as converts, and those converts begin to tell others. They, those people begin to bring others into the church. It's beautiful how that happens. They, they begin to bring their friends, and those friends begin to bring their friends. I see yet churches at times uh, that, that are filled with people who aren't humble. Yeah, they may have been baptized. Yeah, they, they may even be an officer in the church, one of the, one of the leaders of the church. And, you know, some of these people, they think that they're Christians. They may be baptized and so forth, and, and they, they may say, you know, later on, after they understand the gospel of, of God's grace through Christ, they may say, you know, I, I thought I was a Christian, but I never really understood the gospel. Now I see how uptight I was. Now I see how uptight I was in my own self-righteousness. Humility there. The second action for us is, is, is to pray. Is to pray and seek God. Now here's a reminder to not be stuck in the method or certain words maybe that you uh, pray repetitively or maybe that you've memorized. Thinking that the Spirit is only uh, going to work when we pray these certain words. You'll remember C.S. Lewis in the Chronicles of Narnia where he says, you'll get back into Narnia again, uh, but usually not in the same way. Meaning there should be fresh new ways in which we approach God in prayer. Meaning don't necessarily trust in a certain words that you've memorized, but more the heart of prayer. Jesus invites us to focus on the heart of prayer in the Lord's Prayer from Matthew 6, praying, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. See, we're praying to a person there, and we're praying that it would be God's will that would be done. We're announcing, God, you know better than I know for, for my own life. Therefore, whatever I'm praying, I should... In that prayer, I'm saying, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus invites us to focus on our need. In Matthew chapter 7, he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Admit your need. Let that motivate you into seeking God and praying. And the Bible also teaches us that we should be praying for our nation, whatever nation it is that you, that you live in. 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Jesus invites us to pray 
for the kingdom of God to expand. Matthew chapter 27, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. As Jesus is weeping over that city, Jerusalem, grieving for Jerusalem when she doesn't repent. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. It's this invitation of prayer to seek God to, to actually share the heart of Jesus, that we too will learn to love and pray for our neighborhood, for our city, and yes, for our nation and also all nations. Now, the next one here is to turn from your wicked ways. That means to repent. What leads to repentance, by the way? Is it guilt? Is it shame? If we, if we just feel guilty or we make someone else feel shame enough that they're going to change and repent? Is it legalism, right? And, and this is like, usually in the church, this is some sort of rigid conservatism, just joyless, uh, people wanting authority and structure and someone, um, you know, they, they get converted and they just want someone to tell them all the things to do and not to do. And they just really want to recruit others to come in and follow those same rules. Uh, is it antinomianism that leads to repentance? You know, sort of a, a, an anti-law or anti God's commandments. Is that what leads to repentance? And this in the church is like a, a type of liberalism that says, you know what, do what you want. God is merciful. God will forgive you anyway. And that's from Romans chapter 6. Shall we keep on sinning so that we can get more grace? May it never be. Paul, the writer there, answers. Well, what is it that leads to repentance? It's not legalism. It's not antinomianism. And by the way, this is a work that only God can do. It's the riches of God's kindness and grace that leads to repentance. Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, Or do you presume on the riches of God's kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Well, there's this beautiful example of public repentance happening. Public repentance, the great Pyongyang revival of 1907, and the city Pyongyang is the capital, current day capital city of North Korea. Uh, yeah, at this Presbyterian seminary, there was this Bible conference, and over a thousand men uh, began to publicly confess their sins and publicly repent. And because of that repentance, there began to be life change. And life change, repentance always brings life change. And so some of those Koreans who were repenting began going back to Chinese propri proprietors and confessing how they had cheated them in the past. Yeah, they, they started going back to some of those Chinese business owners and actually confessing how they had cheated them before. That, that's what happens when the gospel of grace comes to you, is there's truly humility. There's true prayer and prayer for the kingdom and seeking God and repentance. Now, in conclusion, let me go back to this Finding Your Roots show. Again, if you haven't seen it, I invite you to go watch this show, Finding Your Roots. If you have seen it, you know there's this part in each episode where each participant of the show is given this book. Right, Henry Louis Gates Jr. gives them this book and they can see the pictures of their, uh, some of their ancestors. They're given, they're given this large poster of their family tree. It, it brings tears to, you, to your eyes as you watch it, but, but imagine... Imagine instead of sitting down 
with Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. Imagine God sitting down with you. God sitting down with you and wanting to help you find your roots. And if you're not a Christian listening to this, imagine that God would be sitting down to you, inviting you to be engrafted into this family tree, to be adopted into God's family. And if you're a Christian, imagine God sitting down there with you very intimately, reminding you that you belong to God. We need to be reminded of who we belong to. And imagine God reminding you that your story is going somewhere. Because God's story, that grand narrative, is going somewhere. Let's participate. Let's participate and partner with God in this story. And let's respond in humility and in prayer and in seeking God and in repentance. Let's pray together right now. Dear Lord, dear Lord, at times we, we, do, we, we don't give you much to work with, but we thank you for your patience and your kindness that leads us to repentance. Thank you for your tenacity and your commitment to pursue us and to pursue the nations. We pray that you would lead us to humility. Lead us towards seeking you. Lead us towards repentance as we wait on you to bring healing. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.
we celebrate communion, it is a celebration because we have fellowship with the God who hears us, a God who forgives us, and a God who heals us. So we're going to enter into a time of confession, confessing our sins and repenting, and we're going to be using Jeremiah, who was one of the prophets during uh, the book of Samuel and Kings. And uh, we're going to be using Jeremiah chapter 4, where the prophet Jeremiah says, Return to me, declares the Lord. It's an invitation to return to this God. So let's confess our sins now, and then we'll receive the Lord's forgiveness as we celebrate communion together. Father, we celebrate, we thank you for your mercy, your grace that comes to us through the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Christ's life, Christ's death, Christ's resurrection that brings forgiveness and brings healing and brings promise to our future. That Christ, you will return and bring complete restoration. And so we pray this in your name. Amen. For it was on that very night that Christ was betrayed that he took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks for it. And he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, Christ pours out wine and he says, this wine is a symbol of my blood, which is poured out for you. 
for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this also in remembrance of me. As we celebrate our fellowship with God together, we now receive a closing blessing, a benediction taken from the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 20, verse 21. Please receive this benediction. Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever.